earlier this month, the UN had its summit for the future and they talk about the military application of AI and talk about how that is a substantial concern that they want to address. I exported this into Notebook LM, right? And then I asked it, can you create a podcast for me? So this moment, I would like to play you the podcast. Yeah, you know. this was one of those weeks. Yeah, tell me about it. Feels like every time I refresh my feed, there's a new breakthrough, a new controversy, or a new existential crisis to ponder. Exactly. Is this going in the direction of AGI? Are we there? Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of the Outpost podcast. We still get applause. Yay. Yeah. Uh, obviously, all of you have seen episode 1 and that's why you're tuning in for episode 2. Um, and we're hoping that this will also be as engaging and will let you know a little bit more about AI than when you started. Uh, and with that, we are going to do our usual format, which is a breakdown on an AI topic that caught our eye this past week uh, by each one of us. Uh, of course, with me, I have uh, Dushyant, Soham, and I'm Sarnia. And uh, we are going to walk you through uh, everything that we found interesting. So to begin with, Dushyant, over to you. Hi, folks. In today's episode, I'm going to walk you through the most top topic on the AI landscape is uh, OpenAI's O1 model. So to start with, uh, there's a fundamental difference in how GPT models work. So if you look at GPT models, are uh, they are text generation models. They are trained on an architecture called Transformer. Uh, and there's a wonderful paper you could read more about if you want to learn more about what Transformer models are and how GPT is kind of, you know, the amazing power it has is based on the paper called Attention is All You Need. What it does is that whenever you give a prompt to uh, to the GPT or, or LLM, it tries to understand, uh, gives a self-attention to the inputs that you are given and then try to understand, okay, what you are trying to perform a task or what is your request and then gives an answer. So let's say if I want to understand more about okay, what's the multiplication of two large numbers and it gives me an answer for that. Or if I want to basically kind of ask, okay, can you um, review this particular paragraph of text and it gives me uh, kind of you no know, observation. If there's any grammatical mistake, do I need to add more uh, like, you know, adverb, adjectives and, 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 and things like that. Come back now, OpenAI recently launched a new model called O1 there are two versions of O1 model. One is O1 Preview and another is O1 Mini. O1 Mini is not in preview, but O1 Preview is you can try if you have a chat GPT uh, plus subscription, you can try it uh, today with that. Now, what's so interesting about this model or the code name Strawberry uh, uh, for this model is that you might have seen a lot of people asking question to chat GPT that, okay, how many hours are there in a strawberry? Correct? Uh, so clearly, and, and model kind of you know, gives you surprising result out of it because it isn't kind of you know, trained to do a reasoning task, correct? Uh, and, and that was kind of you know, really, really uh, uh, interesting and, and many were embarrassing for OpenAI. So they kind of you know, come up with it. How do we make our models which, are, uh, which can do at least a basic level of reasoning out of it, correct? And then the LLMs can be used for a variety of tasks. Now, to do reasoning, it's a for us, it is a natural because we have studied, uh, you know, in our education. But imagine teaching an AI to do reason, it's a completely different way of it. Uh, so to do that, there is a new architecture or new approach to training your model. It's called chain of thought modeling. So chain of thought was a, a approach that Google research team uh, started first. Uh, it was paper published in 2022. And uh, it basically kind of you know, highlights, okay, what is a standard prompting technique look like? So I just explained it, okay, imagine that, you know, you want to say that, okay, Soham has a five tennis ball. And like, you know, he buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each has a three tennis balls. How many tennis balls Soham has? So you get an answer of 11, which is kind of, you no. Know, uh, straightforward so this is how you get in information but in chain of thought prompting what does uh, a model is try to kind of you know, break down your prompt 
into a subtask or a smaller task which it can reason with and and because of it kind of you no know, breaking down and perform this isolated uh, uh, independent small task the accuracy and performance of that uh, uh, answer would be kind of you no know, much higher so so that's a fundamental difference between them uh, and and google published some of its results on palm and 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 some of the other lambda uh, uh, llm kind of you no know, uh, family of products there so so this is a paper really interesting paper i highly encourage you to kind of you know, go ahead and have a look at it if you want to know more about it uh, i believe uh, this is the paper that they kind of you know, published uh, and they have also given some interesting results on how you can imp- implement this on your so let's say if you're using any open source uh, uh, version of llm and you want to kind of you know uh, integrate chain of thought prompting in your thing there is enough and more information out there but mind you it takes a lot of infrastructure to be able to do that while there are a lot of benefits in terms of accuracy performance and all uh, the the downside of chain of thought modeling is that it takes more time because it's thinking correct it, it is not jumping to answer uh, to your prompt but it's kind of it it understands what you're trying to ask breaks them down does individual computations and then combines it and gives you the final answer out of it uh let's look at what uh, open ai team had to kind of you know uh, share this so this was the press release that it did on september 12 <coughs> around two weeks back and uh, so this is what they are basically talking about correct they are using reinforcement learning to perform this chain of thought uh, prompting process and what it's trying to do is that it is let's say if i give a particular prompt it's trying to kind of you know understand that prompt and every single time it kind of you know reinforces uh, uh, what a particular task has been given to so it breaks down and then okay so take an example of let's say i want the same example of how many hours are there in strawberry correct so what it try to do is understand okay what what is the task here i want to i need to count and a particular alphabet in a word so that's kind of you no know, task one then it kind of okay what is that alphabet uh the alphabet is r and what is a word word is a strawberry correct so it's a second level of that the third one is it now it iterates strawberry and kind of you no know, finds out okay which all the positions uh, a particular occurrence of an alphabet is there and then at the end of the day it gives you an answer uh it counts the number of occurrences and gives you an answer so so how does it do it basically using reinforcement learning algorithm and every time it kind of you no know, uh, makes a mistake it learns from it and and, and gives you uh hopefully it give you a better answer there the other way to interpret is that if you have more data correct and you are trying to do a, a reasoning task for it a chain of thought can give you much more uh, uh, predictable answers in that case out there so uh, without further ado here are some of the evaluation that they've done and they are saying that chain of thought reasoning is a good for a task for let's say performing a mathematical task that if you want to do it right. or if you want to do uh, uh, coding like you now we have all seen chat gpt and and other llms doing a basic code generation out of it but now it can be more interactive uh, it can understand your uh, a prompt much better and give you a much uh, a closer kind of you no know, examples of uh, code that you want to generate out of it it can also perform much better on science based prompts that you are asking out of it these are some of the evaluations so here uh, uh, o1 is kind of evaluated on a math competition olympiad out of it uh, this one is like you no know, uh, code generation on code forces and the last one is on phd level science questions and and its performance compared to other models on there uh, what i like about it is that they have also given an, an an examples of it so let's say this one is like a, an example of a cipher where it gives a, a sort of a cipher code and it gives an answer that okay the for this particular cipher the answer is think st- step by step now use the above example and and give me an answer for this particular cipher now this was done on uh, gpt 4o and this one is an o1 preview so if you go down it is also try to kind of you know uh, breaks down task but the answer what it kind of you know gives you is after a point in time it just gives up correct right uh 
but in case of O1, uh, it it gives you a complete understanding of okay, what is the first word? This one. What are the pairs? What are the decoded letters? What is the second word? So it kind of you no. Know, imagine like you know how you do a think aloud while you solve a problem, correct? Yeah. So it kind of you no know, thinking aloud and giving you okay, this is what I'm how I'm performing a calculation. This is how I'm understanding the particular prompt, and at the end it gives a final answer, which is there are three R's. <laughs> in a strawberry uh, coding also like you know it can write a bash script uh, which can give an answer and there are variety of other uh, fields uh, on which they have explored performance of o1 being much much better on the compared to a predecessor one but i'll not i'll spare you with all the details and we'll jump into the actual uh, demo of chat gpt so if you have a chat uh, gpt plus you can actually move between the different uh, models I have selected O1 Preview. You can also select O1 Mini, depending on uh, your preferences. Uh, let's say, let's start with the first one. Is uh, how many R's are in strawberry? And you see here, it kind of you know, gives you um, a kind of you know, prompts and it's a thinking. And it took a five second to kind of you know, uh, uh, give a reply to this particular prompt uh, and he said I'm telling the occurrences of R in a word strawberry by example each letter one by one and noting their positions and there are three letters uh, of R in the word strawberry and this could be any uh, uh, letter so let's say how many M's are there in a in Malia love correct so there are two letters of M, correct? And you can say how it is thinking and how it's kind of you know, performing. Now, these are very simple kind of you know, tasks there. What about kind of you know, we up and a bit of an enter there and see uh, 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 something else as well. So I always kind of am fascinated by math because math is a, a pretty interesting field. It requires a, a, some bit of a thinking uh, calculations and and computers are really best suited for performing large complex computations. Uh, so let's see if ChatGPT or O1 model can uh, perform that. So one of the prompts that I came across when I was learning more about O1 uh, is on calculating first or last digit of prime numbers and see what happens it. What is the last four uh, numbers of... Uh, of first 70 prime number editions correct uh, let's let's wait for it to kind of know uh, give us the final answer but my assumption is that yes 0887 uh, so that seems to be correct yes. this is the total uh, kind of no addition of all of this prime numbers uh, which have n and then kind of the last four digit is basically this one so super interesting uh, and what previously if you if you try to do something like this in uh, in previous version of model uh, the two things could happen a you won't get a chain of thought uh, and in the case when you get a chain of thought it kind of you know uh, after a point in time it gives us maybe it reaches the token input token limit or output token limit the other thing about o1 is that the the token limit has increased significantly. It used to be eight thousand uh, tokens before, but now it is kind of no sig. I think one hundred twenty eight k, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so, which is kind of a massive number of tokens you can kind of no give in, and and from that input prompt, it can break it down and kind of give you really uh, interesting answers there. The last one is one of my favorite, and I'm going to uh, see if I can find that. So it was on Reddit I have come across. So this is a prompt which basically says that Peter has a five candle that are all the same length and he lights them all at the same time. And after a while he blows out the candles one after another one. Which of the five candles was the first one he has blown out? And, and, and here is the figure of the five candles after they have been blown out. So what LLM has to do is that it has to understand my prompt 
and then it has to look at the additional information or supplementary information that has been given in terms of the the length of the candles and then kind of to figure out okay which one is the right answer if you look at here the three is an answer right. because that that must have been kind of blown out first by by peter oh okay. wonderful so candle three is the longest one so so now you can understand what it is doing correct i think i again want to summarize that some of the things that we're trying to do with o1 model or what chat gpt wants the user to do is that you can have a complex prompt correct which kind of no uh, uh, does a really complex computation but at the same time you can reason with it you can go back and you can try to uh, get a peep into how the o1 model is thinking but the other thing is that it does not always give you uh, uh, this this view into things sometimes you might see that the chain of thought is hidden for uh, uh, and this is predominantly in two reasons an area where the safety of kind of you no know, ai and the users and everything is 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 also important so if you ask a prompt which is controversial or which is not abiding by the policies and all Uh, mm-hmm. you may not kind of you no know, get the the chain of thought reasoning because these are like you know a, a model which is still in development uh, and it doesn't want to kind of you no know, give a wrong information out there so in, in some of those cases you may not get the chain of thought reasoning and the second thing is also they have been kind of you no know, uh, and this model is not open source by the way and and they want to kind of you know, protect their ip and, and 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 information of they don't want other models to be able to kind of you no know, train on what uh, the chain of thought been kind of you no know, given by o1 preview out of it so in some cases you would you may not find that uh, but in 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 usual cases you will really uh, you should be able to kind of look at the chain of thought there chain of thought is not just only in o1 and by the way you can also try it in in gemini pro 1.5 and some and i think claude 3.5 as well uh, but this is this is super interesting uh, if you are exploring use cases around math coding or even science based prompting i think this should really really give you uh, some interesting answers there i heard about somebody like a phd student if i understand correctly who tried o1 and uh, his phd in as part of his work he requires to come up with a hypothesis and then uh, create an experiment to test his hypothesis so apparently o1 created uh, was able to create an experiment which was not only as good as uh, the kind of output of his research over years but was also able to think of new parameters that he hadn't thought of um and it took a couple of prompts it took a couple of back and forths so that's really blowing people's mind so i think my question to you dushant is is this going in the direction of agi are we there are we there yet when you look at the kind of you no know, progress uh, the open ai and all the other llm like you know vendors have have been able to do in the last few years is a phenomenal uh, it's certainly a path forward i would say but when you look at agi from my perspective i think it's much more than this right uh, i think there was an interesting uh, post by hugging face ceo yeah. he said it is it is wrong for us to assume that the machines are thinking like how humans are thinking correct right it's certainly chain of thought is a phenomenal technique uh, in terms of understanding context how do you derive context from the prompts and and be able to kind of you know uh, think along with uh, uh, users and and achieve the particular task but agi is a very different very separate uh, discussions altogether but that's just my personal opinion uh having said that i think this is definitely a step forward in terms of how ai has been kind of you no know, transforming uh, like you know across industry out of it um and it's an it's an exciting discovery i had a interesting observation so while you were doing this right like i was just trying to play with claude and this see right like what does claude think about this right so let me just share my screen so i asked claude the same question right what is the what are the last four digits of the sum of the first 70 prime numbers right so it's very interesting so it kind of broke down the problems the problem in the right way right the first 70 prime numbers will sum these numbers then we extract the last digits of the sum right got the steps correct from what i understand uh, sonnet 3.5 is the model i'm using it doesn't have this 
uh, chain of thought, right? Okay. So it got some of it correct. It actually identified the the numbers, the seventy prime numbers correctly. Okay. But this is where it failed, right? Somehow uh, the some of these seventy prime numbers it just couldn't do, which is very strange, right? Because mm-hmm. I have been using Claude like very aggressively and uh, effectively, and it's done a lot of math really well for me. And so it says the uh, you know sum is seven three one five six, which is incorrect. Yours your number was correct, and the last four okay. digits are three one five six, which is very strange, right? It it fails in this step. It's identified the first step correctly. The second step is a failure. Third step is actually correct, assuming that the the second step was correct, right? So very uh, strange, right? And then I ask it: Is the sum correct? Can you check, right? It apologizes, which it always does, and then gives a like completely random like a sum, it's a hallucinated sum, gives a hallucinated, you know, a last four digits. I just ask it point blank. Are you actually adding these <laughs> so, numbers? So, so are you just being mean to the machine now? So it's just like you know, you're right to be skeptical, right? It's just slow. Yeah. Right? And then what I do is I just take these numbers, I just copy it and just paste it over here, right? Can you add these numbers, right? And it gives the right answer, right? Which is absolutely correct, right? So it's a four digits a zero eight eight seven, right? Which is very strange, right? So there's something which is going wrong, which I think one is getting right. I guess all these models are very smart, and there's some uh, probably chain of thought that's missing, right? Like, even though I asked it to add it, it's capable of addition. It's just not able to do that as a series of steps, right? Uh, Dushan, do you want to try the same question on four O? Yeah, I can. So I am going to four O. Uh, yeah. So yes. This is O. I'm just copy pasting, being lazy here. So here I got a correct answer. Okay. Zero eight eight seven. Can you start a new chat, uh, Dishant? What happens? It carries that forward is... the results. It's on the I top. Did... Yeah. Okay. This was a different one. <laughs> I think I clicked a prompt by default there, and I stopped it. Uh, but let me just write this one. Okay. Cool. Turns out ChatGPT is just better at math. Yes. So so let's say if you want to kind of know if you want to say okay how many is in the world correct oh this okay. is yeah so it seems kind of no uh, this it's has no just over of... gotten better so is it just that because you have the paid subscription is why o1 and i'm trying to say who does four exist for now Thanks to Shant for such an amazing, you know, uh, conversation. So who's next, yeah. Saranya? What are we, uh, Saranya, learning about today? So earlier this month, um, the UN had its summit for the future of the future, summit for the future, uh, which is a multilateral, um, you know, country event, and the last one of this scale happened in two thousand five. um and it's seen as a really big deal where they take on a whole bunch of things and in that they have a very significant pact for the future and there is a summit for the future document that they come up with and stuff like that which is basically trying to say how can the un as this international body kind of nudge us towards where we want to be now the summit for the future is a long ass document which covers a whole bunch of what 53 goals which which try to talk about different measures and objectives with which it tries to achieve its seven uh, sustainable development goals the sdgs and to talk about different ways in which they're trying to do that but it will also be relevant to note that this year summit for the future which also in it had a separate digital alliance uh, document it had about 39 ai references and it talked about in great detail about how they want to discuss ai all the references to ai and why that should be interesting to us okay uh, i'll go through it very quickly so first things first the first thing that they achieve in the action is that they talk about the military application of ai and talk about how that is a substantial concern that they want to address uh this is right up top in terms of opportunities associated with new and emerging technology military applications comes first then we do a deep dive into the global digital compact 
talk through the different objectives, uh, closing digital divides and accelerating progress, expanding inclusion, uh, then foster inclusive, open, safe, and secure digital space, advanced, responsible, equitable, and interoperable data governance approaches, and enhance international governance of AI for the benefit of humanity. You can see there's an entire clause put out over here. Now, before we go ahead, I know everybody is zoning out, and I get it. Uh, sometimes I do too. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about why this is relevant and why this is interesting. And we'll I'll deep dive that in just a bit. But uh, is this the first international community effort in talking about AI governance? Absolutely not. Uh, this is not even the first one like in the past two, three years, right? There's been a lot of this. It was the there was something which was uh, called the Bletchley. Uh, it was done with the UK government, where there's a large international body talking about trying to create safe and inclusive AI. And there's a bunch of similar efforts. Uh, but what I do want to take you through is where the international community is seeing AI and the different lenses with which they are operating it. Uh, because I think this does have an imminent impact on the way AI regulation is formed, at least utilized. Um, if we talk about AI as a resource, uh, unfortunately, that does fall under developed and developing country uh, axes, and then the availability of it starts getting complicated and so on and so forth. So what is if you replace AI with oil? try replacing AI with any other rich resource, and then try reading this document, you'll see that it's actually trying to achieve a lot of things. So I'm going to quickly touch upon some of the things it talks about, right? I want to talk about the open AI models. Now, this is where it really gets fun. Objective three, when it talks about a safe and secure digital space, talks about by 2030 to develop um, amongst open, open software, open data, open AI models. And I'm going to come back to this in just a bit because it looks like, you know, some kind of alliteration that is trying to achieve in a document, but I really think it's trying to get somewhere deeper and I want to get to just a bit. Um, of course, the last objective is basically AI focused, uh, which is, you know, while the others talk about objectives, this is talking about a particular intent which is governance of AI for the benefit of humanity. Uh, they're fully recognizing on multiple fronts that AI is going to be super complicated and we need to figure out ways in which we can harness it to, uh, to address for humanity as opposed to against. Um, some of the interesting pieces that it talks about is inclusiveness, which I find very important uh, because while the creators of AI and the consumers of AI may not be equally balanced in terms of where the large models are coming out of. Saying that you will create a governance model which is more inclusive is very interesting. It's balanced, inclusive, and risk-based. Um, full and equal representation of all countries, especially developing countries. There's a specific call out that they've made, which I'm sure, um, you know, most countries just outside of US and Europe should look into it substantial, uh, would which should welcome, if nothing else. Um, and it has a whole bunch of things on inclusively assessing. Uh, risks of artificial intelligence are called out. Now, this comes to a major aspect, and I'll leave this document somewhere where everybody can find, so you can have a look at this and read through this as one does during your free time once you are deciding what to do with your evening. Um, establish a multidisciplinary, independent, international scientific panel on AI. Uh, what I find interesting over here is while the run-ups to this document have talked about how they want to create an AI panel for uh, risk assessment and risk mitigation, this multidisciplinary, independent panel seems to to have as its primary objective, scientific understanding. And I think this is really fun because if you remember the earlier conversation we had on the AI safety bill, a lot of it ended up with, but this is misunderstanding what AI really does, but this is misunderstanding what models can really do. And this is with a gross misunderstanding of how any of this works. So I think there is a certain level of at least evidenced humility in saying, we are just gonna to try to understand what the hell is going on and then use that as a baseline to start building, regulating, governing, assessing, mitigating risks. At least that's the way I'm reading it. 
I'm taking it on face value as, you know, that being the overall objective rather than diving right into let's fix this thing. Uh, but that is definitely one of the key objectives. And then definitely talking about, you know, impact assessment and risk and opportunity and all of that um, good stuff. Uh, but with all of this, I think the idea is to have a global dialogue on AI governance and to see where that conversation lands. Now, let's go back to one of the earlier things we saw, which is on open AI models. Um, so when I saw the objective of open AI models, I of course went down like a rabbit hole of, are all models open today? When we say which is an open AI model, what are the different licensing regimes for the different artificial intelligence models? Um, and would you believe it? Not everything is open source. Uh, and like you absolutely rightly mentioned, Dushant, O1 is, you know, by design, admittedly not open source. You're not discussing what that is. Uh, but I think it's really interesting to start looking at what are the different licensing formats for AI models. Because when does it become open source? When does it become, uh, and what are the different licensing regimes? For example, did you know that there is an AI specific licensing regime called RAIL, which is intended to be only end use, um, end use restrictions. And I think that's a, just a new tool with which to govern. So for example, if you look at right from the European Union's AI Act, to uh, the California AI safety bill. A lot of them talk about con con unintended consequences or how you know this entire th can, thing can become a genie out of the bottle. But what if you were trying to say that this is then a license violation? This is then breaking the terms of the license. Is that a way in which we can start protecting more of the developer community, still maintaining some version of outsourcing by saying, I have a clear sense of where I want this to be used and Anything which is using, not using that is violating the terms of this. Um, is that a cop out from a developer? I don't know. But is that just a new vocabulary with which we can start talking about what AI can and cannot do or rather should or should not do? I think is a, another way to govern AI without scaring the crap out of everybody. I know that this seems like it's something that's happening in the background. It's like happening in New York. Why do we care? Uh, there was also a huge AI conference with a bunch of practitioners from across the world, which was really interesting. Um, but I think, especially at where we are in our AI story, these are markers where you start getting to the kind of language of AI governance we need. It's going to take a long time for us to get there. Uh, for the next foreseeable future, everything is going to be vague. Everything is going to completely miss the mark. Uh, but these are the different markers we are seeing as we, we get to that final bit. So yeah, that's what's happening. And I think I'm going to try to maybe do a deep dive of different um, ML licensing uh, in our next episode. So there's been so much buzz about uh, this UN summit uh, yeah. for a variety of reasons, because whenever there is a meeting of all the world leaders, correct? Yeah. Things kind of know. Uh, but this is the first time I'm seeing the AI being the topic of interest at that uh, meeting where everybody's talking yeah. about it. And then thank you for like, you know, creating those relevant kind of you know, points and sharing with us. So that's, I think, super nice. Second thing I would say, Given the current geopolitical situation, I think it's imperative for people to come and talk about the yeah. uh, the the use and the restrictions of where AI can be used. And so I think I think it makes sense. Uh, while I have heard about the end user licensing, but to, if you ask me, I don't understand it fully. No, I don't know how they are going to. Um, I enforce. think the auditability, yeah, exactly. The enforcement yeah. and the auditability. And I don't know how it's going to work. And uh, yeah, it raises a lot of questions about what is expected. So for example, when you're talking about open source, or you're talking about, and again, that's becoming a spectrum because that involves uh, data. It involves other components, which will make it either completely open source um, or like what level of it is going to be open sourced. And uh, to what end? Because does it mean automatically better explainability? Not really. It can it can lead towards it, but not automatically assuring explainability. So I think there are lots of questions to be answered as we start thinking about um, how 
all of this grows and how it starts impacting uh, our participation in it. Um, and yeah, I think those are things which will be super fun to figure out. I think most of us think that, you know, um, again, chat GPT, Claude, all, uh, Gemini, all these models are really good and, you know, we can use them everywhere. But when yeah. we speak to, you know, folks from the enterprise, most of these models cannot be used because you can't deploy them everywhere. There's a lot of licensing yeah. concerns. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, typically this is a really interesting GitHub page, which you can just go to and, and just check out the, the, at least for the large language models, not others, but at least for LLMs, you can go and check out the, the license. Right. Um, although this Apache 2.0 doesn't really mean a lot when we're talking about an LLM, but at least there's some point of reference, right. And, even even open models, right? Supposedly, like Llama or whatever, like Llama three, is not really, you know, open, right? Like it's free unless you know less than seven hundred million. Then there's a huge caveat if you're beyond that. So it's just very very uh, crazy. And then you know, uh, for benchmarks also, like on uh, Hugging Face, now there are uh, you know licenses and all as you can see, right? Which performs the best based on the license. So I think. To your point, that's where I think understanding this is going to get more interesting because number one, free to use and open are not the same thing. <clears throat> and exactly. then free to use is going to have, you know, its own limits and things like that. Um, and then I want to then start reproducing it or I want to start building on it. How do I do that? Or can I not? And then some of it by design, they are saying, no, you know what? We are not ready to open source this yet. Uh, given that at this point, AI companies are raising funding of like small countries. I think it's useful to understand where this is going to go. And it's an arms race. And at some point, it's going to be an arms race, which has nothing in, in it's going to just happen amongst them. And once it kind of all balances itself out, that's when we come back into the picture. Right now, we are, let's say for the next three years, we're not really the target consumer. They are trying to out, uh, out smart the other one. And uh, then maybe in a couple of years, we'll start figuring out actually what's happening. And until then, we'll be using it for like, I don't know, writing scripts and making a joke or two. Awesome. Thanks, Saranya, for the, you know, really insightful uh, conversation with this. I'll uh, go to something a little lighter, probably. And, um, and, and I'll continue the jokes on strawberry. So today I'm going to talk about um, a notebook LM. So essentially, Notebook LM is a very interesting project, right? It's an AI first notebook that was released by Google a couple of months, I would say a year back now. Right? This is the original uh, uh, blog post uh, announcing Notebook LM. So essentially, you know, what is it? It's basically a place where you can go and upload uh, documents, upload different uh, artifacts, and it would basically give you an interface where you could talk to it and you know, query it, create uh, flashcards, help you like learn and uh, keep yourself up to date and, and uh, kind of question yourself. It's very helpful for students and stuff like that, professors, you know, um, that was the initial thought process for it, right? right. Uh, which is which is a very interesting use case. And coming from Google, it's, you know, they have so many products and this is the first time they have created something that's very practical in nature, right? Not just um, an SDK or a large language model that you can use for anything else, right? So, uh, you know, an update to this was launched uh, sometime last week and I thought I'll, I'll just check out, right? Check this out and kind of blow everybody's mind, right? So now with this, uh, this is the actual notebook uh, LM that uh, you can go and check it out. So it's available as a uh, free uh, tool right now. And of course, there are uh, some paid tier uh, tiers as well. For the basic tiers, I don't think you need a subscription or anything. You can just sign up and, and try this out. Right. So what it do now does is apart from just uploading documents and making sense out of them and asking questions, it also creates a podcast. Right. And uh, what better uh, way to kind of freak my fellow co-host than to create a podcast on the fly using an AI tool. Right. So it's an existential question that I'll ask all of you and probably like see what happens. Right. So this is the Outpost AI podcast. So what I did was uh, went to the Outpost AI site. So we have this newsletter section over here right uh, where we show all the newsletters right like uh, what is happening every single week right and um, I just went to the latest uh, newsletter that we kind of published last week 
right? It has all these different sections, right? Story of the week, must reads, startups, we have all these different sections, right? I just printed this out, right? I exported this as a PDF, right? And then I thought, let's create a podcast out of this, right? Do we actually need a team of experts, quote unquote, like us to do How this podcast, you? right? Completely so, unacceptable. Yes, exactly. Right. So I thought, <laughs> let's replace all of us as we're getting this started. Right. So let's do this. So I exported all of this as a PDF. It was a very like hodgepodge PDF. It's, you know, if you print stuff out, you know how there are page breaks and all. So it's uh, not a great job. Right. So I exported this into Notebook LM. Right. Did nothing. I didn't even ask questions. I actually exported two, but I just exported the first one. Right. And then I asked it, can you create a podcast for me? I didn't even like change the prompt. There's a default prompt for creating a podcast. It took about 10 minutes and it created a podcast, right, for uh, this topic. Right. So this moment, I would like to play you the podcast and, and show you, right, what's possible with, uh, with Notebook LM. And then I explain what's happening in the background. Man, some weeks the AI news is moving so fast. It's almost like drinking from a fire hose. Yeah, you know, this was one of those weeks. Yeah, tell me about it. Feels like every time I refresh my feed, there's a new breakthrough, a new controversy, or a new existential crisis to ponder. Exactly. This week we're diving into the September 19th edition of the Outpost.ai newsletter, and let me tell you, they did not disappoint with the sheer volume of well everything. It's a dense one, that's for sure. So to make sure we don't miss any of the good stuff. Yep. Yeah. We're going to tackle this deep dive in three parts. Sounds like a plan. Where should we even start? Well, we have to start with OpenAI. Again, they're back in the headlines. And it's not just another chat GPT spinoff or something. Right, because those are coming out practically every other day now. I know, right? But this is different. This is Hold on to your hats, folks. They've dropped this new model, 0101. It's just like pausing it for now. but This is it, insane. Immediate thoughts. Incredible. So, I should be a lot more angry, but I'm just in awe right now. But this is amazing. It's it's not just processing the information. It's kind of trying to be funny and witty as well. And I'm yes. just, what? I don't even know where this falls in the spectrum of everything we've been talking about. This is very and, stressful and very brilliant. And, and <clears throat> I didn't send it a lot of information. Right? This is one page. Right. Right. It's just got these, you know, uh, weekly updates, a little bit of detail, right? Like two or three lines. It didn't go to the specific site and found this out. Just like so much context that it gets yes. from the background and kind of puts it together. Yeah. There's a witty yeah. spin to it. It's actually funny, which is strange. Right. Yeah. It's and funny. yeah, there are human pauses and there is a conversation the default conversation is between two people, but apparently you can add more speakers and you can make, like, you can give it a theme, right? So it's incredible, right? Like, I, I actually listened to the entire podcast. It's a 10-minute podcast. And I learned more about the topic and I was intrigued. Not so much more than just, like, reading the news newsletter, right? So this is something we'll actually include in the newsletter, though, moving forward, right? Rather than, you know, do a simple text-to-speech, this is going to be so much yeah. cooler. This is definitely one of those uh, surprising moment, correct? I haven't done podcasts, but I've used Notebook LM just to kind of upload some of the documents and trying to see. And just to reaffirm uh, what Soham mentioned is that listening is such a easier way to kind of you know, at least yeah. uh, understand and then reading things out of it. So I, but this type of conversation to me and it kind of was was super super kind of you know, uh, surprising and but nice surprise yeah. i would say that um, this is great but if i have to if, if someone forces me to be critical of of it correct and, and and i think the way it looks like is that when a podcaster like us do it we have our natural style of communication of introducing a topic or sharing our like you know observations and insights and things out of it to me, this seems very uh, American talk show kind of uh, 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 interest, and nothing wrong with that. Yeah. What I'm trying to say, but that also kind of tells you how the model is trained on what data, mm -hmm. and how it kind of picks up those 
uh, uh, style. So I think the one thing what maybe Soham is as we explore this tool more, and I think Sarana, you should also give it a go. Yeah. So try and see if there are more different styles and, and, and variants of this kind of podcast generation out of it. Because from content wise, like you know, I think it's doing a phenomenal job. I think yeah. I was embarrassed in terms of like you know, how I introduce O1 and how the <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, uh, the, the, the notebook element is super nice and, and I, I think we can all learn from it so it yeah. certainly augments it certainly helps me better uh, a, a podcaster uh, but yeah it's it's super nice uh, lovely thank you thank you for uh, like you know blowing us off like this is like <laughs> super super interesting no Dushant I'm, I still prefer the way that you would do one thing they, they didn't even yes. get the joke of strawberry so yeah whatever um no <laughs> but friend, I, yeah. <laughs> no but i mean my biases uh and vested interest notwithstanding i i i get what you're saying right because i think uh i think the great part is where we are getting to uh you know internet ai information highway whatever we are soon going to get to let's say a baseline in terms of information which is a great thing we can start then operating that everybody has this. Let's say, imagine if like, I don't know, um, it, it's been a while since I've been in academia or, or something like that. But if let's say before the, the day before class, I upload my, my, my homework into this to try to understand the next chapter of my studies, I use a podcast to understand it better. I think it's a great way of baseline understanding that everybody gets to of the content. And then the next level is your perspectives and your insights. And then that's what you're supposed to do as a, as a human, as opposed to, you know, just reading, but try to see how you can add to the conversation. And I think that's, that's great. I think, um, and then it gives, all of this is giving different ways in which people can consume things uh, in a more fun way. And, you know, old text to speech was, was clunky. It sounded like a robot was talking to you. Uh, it was just sounded like something was reading it out to you. It wasn't fun. Um, I don't know where Audible's sales go from here. That's a different conversation. But uh, no, this is, I, I think this, uh, as Dushan mentioned, this is a welcome leveling field. I, that's a very crude way of putting it. But I think it's a fantastic innovation to get everybody on the same page quicker. So AI yeah, in my, that's what I kind of always like to believe. It's, it's a great level playing field. Yeah. Correct. For somebody who has a lot of ideas but don't have know-how, don't have a yeah. skills, I think it elevates that to a level out of it. Having said that, there will always be a need for that, like, you know, expertise, like top 5%, 10% out of it. And I think to do that, I think AI would take a lot of, lot of time and effort. Correct? So, yeah. uh and I think that's true in general, any skill building out of it. Like, you know, you for a particular skill, you'll find so many individuals who are good at doing a particular thing. But if, if you really want that expertise, it is going to be uh, very rare. Uh, but yeah, super, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, <laughs> this is a, a very positive surprise. So um, thank yeah. you. Just, just to add, right, like uh, Notebook LM can do a lot more things. Right? Yes, this yeah. this this feature was just la launched recently, but you can just ask, right? Uh, what happened in in policy uh, recently, right? You can just ask questions like that, and it, it it will actually based on the documents that you've uploaded. Over here, I've just uploaded uh, two documents, right? Like uh, essentially two editions of the newsletter, and uh, you know, let's see if it's able to answer that, right? Like you can you can see, right? tries to get the California one, all these other things, right? Nice. And you can create notes, you can ask questions and kind of do that, which is the core value proposition. But then the question then arises, right? How do you want to deal with like privacy, right? Like if you're uploading all your data to the cloud to, to kind of uh, get analyzed, right? Where do, like where does privacy come in? How is your data secure, right? Like how do you uh, deal with like just ownership of data, right? Which is a very interesting yeah. kind of, dichotomy that we're facing but super interesting uh, platform there's an open source alternative this is just released uh, this week right which can do the podcast bit as well so definitely check it out i'll have the link to you know our first podcast over here in the show notes so you can actually check this out the ai generated one and uh, yeah happy to kind of dive deeper into the open source one probably next week 
by by second episode we have seen how international organizations are going to either try fixing us or not in the meantime how uh, the world is going to change with the way that new models are thinking and at the same time how we are going to become redundant uh, in life so already great start folks fantastic second episode on this great note let's <laughs> let's close the show and yeah. uh, see if you get replaced by next week <laughs>